course, we learn about the basics of cloud computing. We learn about the various features that cloud computing has and how that makes it different from on-premise data centers. We learn about multiple cloud vendors like AWS, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud Platform, but we'll focus on Microsoft Azure. So getting to Microsoft Azure, we we'll learn about the core services that it offers, we learn about security, we we'll learn about performance and how Microsoft Azure is priced and the support options that are offered. So after completing this course, although you, not, you will not be prepared for the certification just from this course, but you'll go a step towards uh, the Microsoft certification or the basics of Microsoft certification fundamentals, which is AZ-900. So after completing this course, you should be able to participate in the cloud conversation topic with your colleagues, with your friends, and with your network. You hold a discussion on Microsoft Azure and understand what, what is being said and participate gainfully in that conversation. You can distinguish between various cloud offerings between Amazon, between Microsoft, between IBM, and between Azure, and many others. And definitely with the knowledge that you gained, you can go a step towards Microsoft certification. So thank you and welcome to my course again and happy learning. So let's start with our first lecture that is cloud computing. So we're all curious to know what is cloud computing. So the objective of this course is an introduction to cloud computing as well as a dive into Azure. So we'll start with cloud computing. Cloud computing is not just a fancy term. It has real implications and there are reasons why it is so much in demand. Cloud computing is really uh, the next generation of computing in comparison to what we had even five or six years ago, and it's really catching up. So why is cloud computing so important? Um, so we should know that the other alternative to cloud computing is on-premise computing, which is uh, you having your own data centers, your own server and hardware uh, in the place where you, uh, and you own it basically. So we'll talk about it later in this lecture. But that, the difference between cloud computing and on-premise hard, hardware is basically uh, ownership and access. However, cloud computing is safer than on-premise hardware, and I coined that term myself. It's not an industry standard term. I just aligned the, um, the acronyms in such a way so that it um, sounds safer and it, that's what cloud computing is all about so it offers you scalability that means um, hardware resources can grow with demand so it scales out or scales up scales out is adding the same configuration of servers scales up is increasing the power of the servers availability which is if one server is down another one will be automatically and immediately available. So when new hardware is always available with optimum performance, that's called availability. Fault tolerance. So your hardware is fail safe. So it would not fail to increasing loads. So fault tolerance is a very important aspect of cloud computing. Elasticity is the ability to scale automatically. So if your configuration is elastic or it is called elastic, what it really means is that it can scale up or scale out automatically. You can compare that to, a, to an elastic band, and that's where the term has come from. It's also resilient. Resiliency is the ability to ward off malware and cyber attacks. Resilient hardware is very much in demand because once you have a malware attack, it takes a really long time to recover from it and it is very expensive. So cloud computing can be summed up by these five letters, S-A-F-E-R, and it's indeed safer than on-premise computing. Now we come to the types of clouds. There's a public cloud, there's a private cloud, and there's a hybrid cloud. So what is a public cloud? Public cloud is what all, what all of us know as cloud computing generally. So it's hosted by a vendor for a charge, say Microsoft, or Amazon, or Google. The hardware can be shared, but it's never open to the public. So what that means is uh, you can access that hardware for a charge or for free on a subscription or a free uh, subscription, but it's not, you cannot access the data center physically. Um, it's secret. 
and it's kept very secure. When we talk about public clouds, Azure, Amazon, Google are the most famous public clouds. There are other clouds and we'll come to that later. Uh, and they're accessible from virtually anywhere in the world. So that's why they're, they're called clouds. Uh, it's called cloud computing is one of the reasons why they are, why it's called so, because one, the data centers are really far away from where you are and they can be accessed from virtually anywhere. So that's the analogy of the cloud. Now it's a private cloud. Private cloud can be hosted by um, very large corporations or the government. And the sole purpose is exclusivity. So um, only the members of the organization which, is, which has created the private cloud can access it or authorized users only can access it. And it's not usually available for public subscription. Now, that is really different from a data center or an on-premise center because um, a private cloud has the additional feature of being safer. As we discussed in the previous slide, it has got scalability, elasticity, fault tolerance, resilience, and uh, availability. So it's different from a traditional data center. Uh, we also are seeing an increasing number of hybrid clouds. What is a hybrid cloud? It's a mix, mix of a public cloud and an on-premise data center. It's not a mix of public cloud and a private cloud. It's a mix of public cloud and an on-premise data centers. And as we progress on this um, course, we'll see that if you have an on-premise data centers center um, and Microsoft technology is running on it, and you opt for Microsoft Azure, that's actually a way to save costs on licensing. So hybrid cloud is very popular because organizations generally tend to have their own on-premise data centers and they want to expand uh, as they're expanding um, uh, their workforce, they're expanding their offerings. And the best way to go is to expand to a hybrid cloud because that means not throwing away your on-premise data center and also, it means that you're reducing cost in your public cloud. So public cloud services are basically of three kinds. Uh, there is IaaS or infrastructure as a service, PaaS, which is platform as a service, SaaS, which is software as a service, and there are on-premise data centers. Um, how do you how to differentiate between the three uh, AASs as a services. So there's infrastructure, there's platform, and there is software. So use, think about Microsoft's own uh, technologies. Um, so IAS is your regular desktop, virtual desktop, or your virtual machines with nothing installed. So it has an underlying, a CPU underlying RAM, underlying network connections. Uh, you cannot change that hardware. You cannot really change the operating system, but you can install software with your own license. So it requires an expert IT knowledge, uh, special infrastructure knowledge, to use a virtual machine with nothing installed. When you go to platform as a service, you have um, an example is a VDI with everything installed that you need. So you cannot change the licensing of the installed software, but add data to the installed software. So it's like, uh, IT, IT folks would be very familiar with this kind of a setup because when you say join a new project, uh, you don't have to install everything from scratch on your local computer, but you get access to a, to a cloud service or a VDI service with everything installed. And then you set up your IDE, you set up your uh, repository and all those things. So you're essentially setting up the data on the installed software. So it's platform as a service. The platform is already there with nothing to install. Well, except for the uh, Notepad++ or any other kind of utility software that you need, but more or less it's ready to go. Uh, the third kind is software as a service. So when you think of software as a service, think of uh, software in the cloud, like Office 360. So Microsoft still has a on desktop or an on laptop installation of your Microsoft Office, 
but they also offer an Office 360, which is you open a web browser and you can uh, access um, online Office 360. So Google Mail or Gmail is also an example of a software as a service. Skype is an example of software as a service. Microsoft Teams, if you have used that, is a software as a service because it's a service that's available anywhere in the world. That's a cloud and it's available publicly to subscribers, of course. Uh, typical users uh, of uh, software as a service are end users, management, business, and people who are not really uh, that much into IT. So they just want to use the end product effectively and uh, they don't want to bother with installing software or setting up code. Uh, so as, as, as the benefit or as the ease of service increases, costs increase. So SaaS offerings are more expensive than IS, obviously because everything's ready for you. You just have to log in and use it uh, as opposed to configuring, setting up, installing, troubleshooting, everything. All that is taken care for you for a price. If you think of a Google Chromebook, that's actually all three merged into a single portable device. It's a great example because a Google Chromebook offers SAS in terms of Google products. It offers platform as a service in terms of the Google ecosystem and, and the infrastructure as a service in terms of the operating system that you can uh, access. So sometimes there's a thin line between IAS and PAS, but it's not really very necessary to understand uh, very deeply the difference between the two because at the end of the day you are using the product uh, for um, for your own use and uh, how you use it uh, sometimes differentiates between IAS and PS. For, uh, for on-premise data centers it's like buying your own hardware installing everything so this is the the anti anti cloud. So whenever you don't have cloud, you have these on-premise data centers. So you have to spend not just on your um, server stacks or racks. You have to spend on security. You have to spend on IT stuff. You have to have um, trained intelligent people working those servers. You have to buy real estate to house the servers. You have to buy cooling equipment. You have to buy um, anything that's necessary for your for operating the data center. You have to take government permissions and there are a lot of things that add up the costs. And that's, the setup cost is not everything. You have to upgrade your software, hardware. You have to uh, increase salaries of your security staff every year. So those things just add up. Now, um, recently we have seen a trend where infrastructure as a service or the concept that I spoke about uh, where uh, you have uh, the bare bare bones machines and you install a software on it that's been replaced by serverless computing. Serverless computing is a, is a concept that's present across all cloud providers. Uh, it's basically um, a term similar to cloud computing um, because it, serverless is not really doesn't really mean it, there's no server at the back. What it really means that you don't have to meddle with the server at the back. You just have to tell that service what you want to compute. So you basically upload a piece of code and, and, come, and it calculates it for you without you having to um, provision any kind of IDE or servers or run any web server or anything. So to you, it's just like a, a software service. And there are container services. Uh, the Kubernetes services which and Docker services, which are another way of packaging your code and your operating system and your runtime into a single runnable service which runs everywhere. So it increasingly takes the need away from infrastructure as a service. So that is about your, your basics of cloud computing. In the next lecture, we learn about various cloud computing vendors and their offerings. So Azure is one of them, uh, but there are other vendors too, which we need to be aware of and how you're going to choose between uh, the different vendors and why 
sometimes uh, making a choice is also very difficult. So let's talk about cloud computing vendors, the companies, the large corporations that offer public cloud services. When we talk about public cloud vendors, the three major players that all of us should know about are Microsoft and their Azure offering. And this course is based on Microsoft Azure and how it uh, how the offerings go on a high high level. And then there's Amazon, a uh, large company that you that does e-commerce, but then it also has its offering called Amazon Web Services or AWS. And then there's Google. You're familiar Google that offers Gmail and that offers Google Drive and Google Photos also offers a cloud service called the Google Cloud Platform or GCP. These are the major players and uh, they have uh, more than 80% of the available cloud market together. And there are emerging players uh, like IBM and IBM is a very large corporation uh, but their uh, cloud offering is still uh, not that popular. It's emerging and then there's Oracle which is also a very large database company but again the cloud service is emerging and we have Alibaba. Alibaba is a China-based company and uh, they have recently forayed into cloud services. But these emerging players um, uh, do not have a very large share of the market, but that does not mean that technology is in any way behind the major players. It's just that uh, they haven't been able to capture a larger share of the market just yet. In addition to the six, there are several smaller, very niche cloud vendors, uh, but they're too small to mention here in a broad course like this. Uh, and most of them are just emerging and they haven't really captured a huge slice of the market. But again, that does not mean technologically they are not uh, uh, in the top notch. So, but most of it, most of their efforts are experimental at this stage, so we'll not mention them. And then there are third-party integrators, third-party system integrators or software outsourcers. And um, so these are companies that do not um, own or operate the cloud, but they are vendors that offer cloud services to clients. So for example, there's a large outsourcing company that has a large pool of talent that's expert in Microsoft Azure, but they do not work for Microsoft. They work for that vendor company. And then there's this client that wants to not just implement cloud services, but they want to do some more um, customization on top of that. So these third party system integrators are ideal to be hired and they have a, usually have a customized commercial package where they help with the cloud installation or migration and customization on top of the migration. And of course, because of their relationship with the large cloud players, they can sometimes arrange for a discount. Uh, most of the times they don't because these services are very competitive. And nearly none of them have their own cloud. Whatever cloud they have is for their own internal use and not for uh, uh, customization or sale uh, like Microsoft or AWS or Google. Interestingly, some cloud vendors are themselves system integrators like IBM and Oracle. And there are divisions within those companies that actually do system integration for AWS or Microsoft Azure. So um, uh, third-party integrators like IBM and Oracle actually work on um, Amazon Cloud or GCP or Azure. So how do you choose a vendor? You know, there are so many options, or at least six options that we spoke about. So it's um, just like buying a car, uh, not necessarily your first car, but just like buying any car. Um, it depends on how much you can afford to spend and how you're going to use it because each cloud vendor has their own specialty and their own pricing and their own preference for certain clients. 
according to Gartner, so Gartner is this, is this research firm, worldwide research firm, that publishes reports or magic quadrants, which tells you which vendor or which manufacturer is in a leading position, which is in a emerging position, which one is, uh, which one has high potential, which one has high commercial sales, not necessarily in that order. And according to the latest Gartner report, Amazon is the number one cloud vendor worldwide, but they're also the most expensive. So we'll come to that later. Microsoft Azure is, is in number two. They're not necessarily the most expensive for all services considered because they're a very beautiful hybrid model where if you have a Microsoft license um, for an on-premise hardware like Windows or SQL Server, you can port that to the cloud. And this is different from the other two. So Amazon or Google do not have an equivalent porting service. And we'll come to that later. Google is the cheapest and it's also number three. Um, so it's not just price that you select your vendor on. Uh, it depends on your specific needs. What do you want to do in the cloud? Do you want to do machine learning? Do you want to do compute? Do you want to use it as a repository? Do you want to use it as a plain vanilla storage? Do you want to compute? Uh, what do you really want to do is a question that you have to ask. All vendors do not offer all technologies, uh, but most vendors offer similar technologies. So if there's a specific requirement that might be offered by only say Google, and then you, you, there, you're, there's no other option that you have if you are choosing a large vendor. It depends on where in the world you're located uh, because all regions in the world would not have access to all services. And some services are specifically located only in the US. So there's that latency or the geographical distance between the client and the cloud provider that will limit um, the speed of the service. Uh, you might want to move to a different vendor that is closer to you and offer the same service to decrease your latency or to increase the speed. Also depends on how large a client you are, how much you can afford. So a simple principle of the cloud market is that the more you can spend upfront, the more you save. And um, that is sometimes difficult for smaller clients. So we'll revisit this pricing principle later on in another lecture, but it definitely depends on how big of a player you are when you're choosing a vendor. So how do you choose a vendor? Um, so by no means the discussions here are exhaustive, but these are the basic points. So Amazon, like I said earlier, it's the most expensive cloud vendor but they offer, they have been in the market for a really long time, and probably the oldest in web services, cloud web services. And uh, for large enterprises, typically in North America, they are the first choice. Um, because not large companies in North America can afford to spend more. They have a large footprint. And since Amazon has been there for a long time, those, those relationships have been firmly established. Google is a new kid on the block uh, in terms of cloud computing for the large players and they offer the cheapest services, some of the cheapest services in storage and compute. And so that's preferred by clients that are located in the EMEA region or emerging markets or the UK where, uh, where clients cannot afford to spend um, so much money as in North America because the financial footprint is just not there. So Google is a very popular choice there. Coming to Microsoft Azure, in terms of pricing, it's, it's right between AWS and Google. Interestingly, Microsoft Azure also has the largest global footprint. So data centers or cloud centers located worldwide, they're the largest in number for Microsoft Azure. Not even the, the oldest cloud vendor, Amazon, has as many data centers in the cloud as Microsoft Azure that dramatically decreases your latency and your government regulations 
while trying to store data or trying to have a compute service. Each of these vendors play their own cards. So IBM and Oracle traditionally large product companies, very large product companies, and they already have existing clients who use their products. And the relationships run for decades. Um, so they always use these relationships, take advantage of these relationships in a nice way with their existing clients and try to push their cloud offerings. And that is how most of their offerings are sold uh, with IBM and Oracle. It's their own products that seamlessly work in the cloud and that makes it a very attractive proposition for the clients. And the licensing is also done in such a way that uh, on migrating to the cloud, the customer pays a lot less than if it were a brand new installation. Alibaba is, is really the newest kid on the block. I said Google was the newest kid, but that is for large vendors. For the other emerging vendors, Alibaba is the latest offering. And as we all know, they're restricted to China and the East Asian markets. And um, they are planning to expand worldwide but currently that's how they are positioned. So do you like to become a cloud vendor? Sure, but how big are you? Becoming a cloud vendor, a public cloud vendor, requires enormous amounts of money, the kind of money that Amazon has, the kind of money that Google has, you know, trillion dollar companies. And they have enormous amounts of money and land and very experienced manpower that they can hire with fat salaries that can truly conceptualize and steer their cloud frameworks and their businesses towards success. Uh, there's an uncertain return on investment. So if there's a, not a good sales here, you should be able to absorb that loss, which these big players can do. If you're a brand new player and you want to enter the cloud market, it's very difficult to disrupt the market because they're already captured by these large players and there are more people that are wanting to get in so it's very difficult to build that trust with clients and offer the same price. You might have a, have cutting edge technology, but if you're charging too high, then people or clients will be a little reluctant in investing. There are government regulations coming up with respect to data. We all know about GDPR. We know about US data regulations. And these, these regulations have recently um, been enhanced in the last decade or so. And it's become increasingly difficult to store foreign data on native soil so, or the other way around. So if you have data that belongs to a particular country, it's very difficult to convince the government that it will be safe in a foreign location. And that makes it very difficult because then it requires you to have data centers everywhere in the world, which is a huge expense. So that's one of the reasons why we do not see too many. So in the next lecture, we will uh, dive into Microsoft Azure. Hopefully this has been a good introduction to cloud computing. And in the next lecture, we'll see what those terms that we studied being safer, um, being uh, how the pricing works, security, all that works in respect of Microsoft Azure. Thank you. So let's jump into Azure Core Services. So Core Services are the basic services provided by any cloud provider. They can include com compute services, storage services, networking services, machine learning, and uh, many such um, important services. So Azure offers a set of those services and we're going to find out uh, how they are uh, set up. If you think about a traditional computer, a desktop or laptop that you might happen to have, uh, it will have an operating system, a processor chip, a RAM, more the better, storage that is a hard drive. It can be a solid state drive or a traditional hard drive. It has to have a network a LAN network which you use to connect to the internet and to your printer and any other uh, device that you might have. Uh, it will have a router which is used to connect to the internet through your service provider. 
it has a display terminal uh, which lets you see what you're doing and it has a keyboard and a mouse and peripherals that, that are input devices into your computing system. It also has software installed on it. Those are the actual software that you work on. Uh, it, it might have storage software like a file system that helps you organize your files around. And it definitely has some security software which helps, you, helps your computer from malware on the internet. And this is the example of a typical desktop or laptop. So what happens when you go to the cloud? So the objective of the cloud computer is to make your computing experience as seamless as possible. Uh, it has to be as close to your on-premise computing environment without sacrificing speed or not costing a ton of money. So when you configure your cloud computer, you have to configure the CPU, the RAM, the storage, all of its components basically. You can choose each and every type of CPU that, that, that are available in the market, the operating systems, the available RAM. But always remember, the more high-end you go, the more you pay. So uh, there are also uh, free services that are available, uh, but they are uh, only for very trivial computing needs. To do anything worthwhile, you will have to uh, move to medium grade uh, CPU and RAM and storage. So these uh, apply for um, your traditional VDIs, um, for IAS and PS, not software as a service. For software as a service, uh, you are actually using the entire installed software on the cloud. And uh, so you have to do a lot less work in configuring your application and then you have to pay more for that service. So always remember that Microsoft Azure and any cloud provider costs are directly proportional to how well you configure your computer. So if it's very well configured, you pay more, but there are also free options. Said. So we come to regions. So these regions are what Microsoft calls where they place the data centers. And each cloud provider calls them differently. Uh, but Microsoft look, likes to call them regions. So when we say cloud, um, it does not mean obviously that your data center is on an actual cloud or on a satellite. It means that it is on a data center somewhere far away and secure. In fact, very secure. Microsoft has a video on their website which shows how secure each of these data centers are. And such regions, there are 60, 60 or more regions worldwide. There are certain secret regions that the government does not want us to know about and Microsoft does not disclose their locations or their existence. And these 60 plus centers are more than Google and AWS individually. So that's a lot of data centers. But why do you need so many data centers? If you remember the safer analogy. Uh, we need fault tolerance, we need availability. To do that, we need multiple copies of the same computer and the more distributed they are the less prone they are to disasters the less prone they are to failures power cuts um, so that is why you need more regions to increase your availability and increase fault tolerance also there are government data regulations uh, that implies that certain data cannot leave the country's boundaries and in, in the countries where these are very strictly enforced, Microsoft prefers to have their own region so that all of the data can be stored within the country. Examples are China, Germany, and the US itself, where certain government data cannot leave the borders. There's also speed of latency. So for example, if you're serving up a web page, there's a content delivery and you have images and uh, media that are stored in the region that is closest to you. So that will increase your access speed because you are because you are only hitting the region that's closest to you. So a lot of regions makes more sense in that case because they are high, highly likely to be closer to one of Microsoft's regions. So look at this map. Uh, you can see the regions are not evenly distributed around the world. They are distributed 
where most economic activity happens, like North America, Western Europe, uh, some parts of India, and some parts of China and Australia. Um, so these are places where Microsoft's clients are located. And it makes sense to have uh, data centers or regions in these places because, um, because of the revenue that Microsoft can earn from them. For other regions, uh, they have to uh, hook onto the nearest region that's available. But also there's the cost and um, US regions are generally cheaper uh, compared to Brazil because of the single data center and there's a lot of uh, cost in transferring data to a remote center. So these things have to be kept in mind when you choose a region. So regions, how do they help? Having multiple regions, we spoke about fault tolerance and availability. Regions can help you maintain active database backups. They do not help with compute resources. So when you come to compute resources, we go to availability zones, which are physical combination of server stacks. So there are multiple availability zones in a single region, which are um, configured to fail over. That means if one availability zone fails, the other can take over. But that is within a single region. But when you compare regions, uh, if you have multiple regions, that helps in uh, active database backups. So database data can be backed up over multiple regions, subject to regulations, obviously. And um, like I spoke about the CDN, the content delivery network capability, reduces latency or the speed of access. Um, we also have the spared regions concept. Paired regions are two regions that are twinned in a way that uh, data replication can happen faster between those two regions and they are cost effective to pair. So that helps in availability. So again, regions have uh, availability zones within themselves that are used to fail over Availability zones can talk to each other, so that's where your fault tolerance and high availability are taken care of. And when there is a lot of load on your particular server, the, the availability zones can help in distributing that load. So that is where they help. And a region is made of multiple availability zones. So come to resources and other groups. So within a particular um, distribution, we have a logical grouping of hardware component. So, for example, if you have uh, subscribed to a cloud service and you want to use a database server, a web server, so and you have multiple web servers and database servers, and you can logically group them into resources uh, groups, into resource groups, and each of these resource groups can have a separate subscription. So the billing is kind of streamlined. Um, these subscriptions can go to a management group. So this management group is a master account where uh, the Azure account billing takes place. But then each of these uh, subscriptions can be accounted for, can be billed separately so that the cost distribution can be visualized and controlled. So we'll speak more about this in the pricing section. So for now, just remember that um, if you have multiple applications, each with a database server, each with a computing um, requirement, each with a storage device, and you can logically group these resources into resource groups and each can have their own subscription to enable in. So, uh, like I said in the last slide, management groups help map logical organizational divisions to Azure. So you can have multiple management groups, so one for HR, one for IT, one for marketing. Each of these has a subscription based on what uh, functions or what resources each of the subscriptions are using. So this is all for uh, billing management, cost management, and we'll revisit this and we'll see how we can reduce or the cost. Come to the Azure Resource Manager. Azure Resource Manager is used to add or update resources using various input devices. So uh, a resource manager can basically control a web app or a virtual machine or any service or a data store using multiple input devices. So there's an Azure portal, which is a web page that you can log into. There's a PowerShell, which is a Linux-like power um, input device. 
there's a CLI which is similar to a PowerShell but which has a little different uh, functionality and there are API clients so using an API call or REST call you can call a Azure service to the Azure resource manager which also helps in the authentication and authorization of your resource so if you have a third-party service that has an API and you want to call a cloud service you can use a REST client and call the Azure Resource Manager, get authenticated, and call the data source. It's just a way of accessing your uh, data source. When we, see, when we talk about Azure Resources, we come to the core services. So uh, what I mean by core services are, there are infrastructure services and the platform services. So infrastructure services comprise of compute, which is your basic uh, virtual machines and containers. Then there's storage, there's solid state, there's hard drives, there's SKUs, there's file storage, there's networking, and which are load balancers, DNS, and VPN. So compute storage networking, this comprise the infrastructure services of Azure when you come to platform services. So infrastructure services are analogous to IAS, platform services are analogous to PAS. Platform services are the content delivery networks for your websites that enable you to deliver images, media content faster. The API services and their online IDEs the database search, uh, database and search uh, services, like an RDBMS uh, service, is a NoSQL service. Um, there are services to migrate your existing database to another one. There's an artificial intelligence service. For example, if you feed it a uh, text, it can speak out what has been fed. It can analyze the uh, the mood of the text. It can analyze an image and say who this uh, image represents, what this image represents. Those are artificial intelligence. And ML services, There's analytics and IoT. IoT is the Internet of Things. So if you have a Roomba device, uh, it can analyze how that device is working, uh, how much efficient it is, and those kind of things for uh, Internet connected devices. We have DevOps services that are uh, services that provide repository services, uh, provide build services, provide um, deploying services. Uh, in the cloud, which is very helpful because these services are follow the same principles of Safer. So they are scalable, they're elastic, they're available, and they never run out of space, which is a big plus when anybody who is doing DevOps can certify off. And then there's serverless computing, which is a more of a marketing term than anything because serverless computing does not actually mean serverless. It means that you do not come in contact with the server. You just upload your code and let the thing do its whatever you want it to do without bothering about installing the server, configuring it, upgrading it, starting it or stopping it. And you pay just by the request or by the second. So there are a lot of services available from Azure itself, but uh, there's a marketplace too. And third party vendors have a lot of apps uh, on, those on, those, uh, on the marketplace where you can choose your app and pay for it. And your app will save you a lot of development time and a lot of design thinking, uh, but you will have to pay for it. Um, sometimes developing your own app is cheaper. Sometimes buying a third party app or renting out a third party app is cheaper. It just depends on the situation. And the added bonus is that there, there are no viruses or malwares in these apps. They're free. They're just like your mobile phone apps that you download from the Google store or or the Apple Store, and uh, so they are certified virus-free, and it's sometimes a good option to, uh, you know, building it, buying it is a better option than building it. So uh, look at the marketplace. Um, uh, just uh, look at the apps that are available. Browse around, and I'm sure you'll find something interesting. Some of the apps are also free, so they're a good try. That's all about the core services. Uh, we have covered in Azure. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll cover the security and performance aspects, which are very, very important for a cloud setup because it's a public cloud. It's open to everybody. Security and performance are paramount. Okay, we'll now speak about Azure security and performance. Security is a big thing in the cloud because the cloud is a shared space. And there's lots and lots of data in there, both uh, public, confidential, and proprietary data, and we are sharing each other's space. 
So uh, security is paramount. Security is supposed to be shared responsibility uh, between the vendor and the user, as we'll see later. Um, also is performance. Performance is very important for a cloud network because any, uh, essentially everything is happening over the internet and uh, there is latency. So there is a slowness because of the geographical distance. So you want to make sure that your, uh, your systems are performing optimally like you want them to. So security and performance are very, very important in any cloud computing network. So how do you see, let's, let's do security first. So how do you see security? Um, how do you visualize it? Microsoft has come up with certain dashboards where you can actually visualize how secure a system is. Um, when a system is supposed to be secure, it's supposed to follow some policies or compliance policies. If you look at a percentage of policies it's complying with, your cloud systems based on how they're configured, then we can have a measure of security right there. The Azure Security Center uh, does just that. It tracks policy and compliance on a visual dashboard. As you can see in the slide, um, uh, this particular instance has a 17% compliance, which is low, but uh, that at, at least gives you a figure from where you can go up or bump it up and make sure that your systems are more secure. So how do you actually implement security? So, um, so we said it's also a, a vendor responsibility and it's also user responsibility. From a vendor's perspective, uh, there is uh, uh, the responsibility is to prevent uh, unauthorized attacks, unauthorized people from accessing your your web pages. A web application firewall is an excellent way to stop any kind of malicious attacks on your servers. So web application firewall is like a firewall, but it's for the cloud. It helps prevent SQL injection, cross-site scripting, which is XSS, session hijacking, and so many new things that come up, that hackers come up with to uh, gain access to your systems. Um, so it's a vendor responsibility and a user responsibility. Uh, the user has a responsibility of correctly designing uh, his own, his or her own networks. So um, you have to ensure that the service that you provision, the storage that you provision, you put that in a correct network. Our network security group does exactly that. It uses a filter to stop or allow inbound and outbound traffic. So it creates a network perimeter around your resources and makes sure that only the traffic that you like to go out and in uh, gets out and in. So there is, uh, it stops any kind of unintended or undesired traffic. Navigation security group is a little uh, bump up over your network security group in that it protects an entire application, say a web server and a database, um, and ring fences it basically. So, uh, so there might be a network security group within an application security group, and both of these uh, work together to make, make sure your systems are not accessed in an, any unauthorized manner. So we are coming to the age of containers where Docker is given it is and, and right ones run anywhere within a net, within a container is getting real uh, big popularity. Um, the traditional ways of uh, protecting an application or a multi-tiered application does not apply to containers. So we have specific uh, rules for uh, container protection that are governed by the Kubernetes network policies. They're specifically designed for container protection. It's not that you cannot protect a container through your regular network uh, policies, but uh, these are more customized towards a container, so they offer greater protection and easier implementation. Another dashboard is an Azure monitor, uh, which helps you to look at various aspects of your system. It lets you look at dashboards, it lets you look at alerts, it lets you track performance anomalies, uh, it lets you look at uh, analytics. It basically helps you to get an overall uh, idea of how your system is performing and uh, whether there are any alerts that you've set up that you can um, quickly act upon. And it acts as a great dashboard for certain IT roles. Another dashboard that we have is an Azure Advisor. Azure Advisor is a little simpler, uh, but it has uh, five or six main uh, widgets, which give you an instant visual depiction of how your system is performing, whether it's available, whether there's security, whether it's performing well, whether there are any impacted resources, whether how, how your cost is doing, whether the operational excellence is going well. 
Um, now there's a natural question as to why you'd want to have so many dashboards. Now the reason we have so many dashboards and we'll see a few more later on is that uh, there are different IT roles and different IT roles have different responsibilities and functions and there is no one size fits all when it comes to dashboard. So different IT roles have to look at different dashboards to make different decisions and to make those decisions quickly and to make those decisions effectively. Microsoft says that they have a seven layered approach to security and the seven layered approach includes vendor responsibility and user responsibility. For example, vendor responsibility is a physical security of the, of the data center. So they're very, very secure with multiple walls and fences and gates and, and access and everything else um, to protect their data center and the data within those servers in the data center. Similarly, the, the user is also responsible in terms of the network layer of layered approach to security. The network layer, the user is responsible to design his network in such a way that it's that it's secure. He is responsible to protect the data uh, in the compute layer with encryption. He's supposed to uh, have checks on who accesses the data. So the seven layered approach works very well when both the vendor uh, and the user are compliant with security. Um, we come back to performance and there, there are uh, quick dashboards again that show you how your system is doing. So logs are a great way to see what how your systems are performing. So logging and performance monitoring is done by the web server diagnostics and application diagnostics specifically for web servers. There's identity and access management that uses multi-factor authentication, role-based access control, password policy enforcement. So it basically makes sure that it uh, uh, it verifies who you are and what your roles are. Something called a key vault that helps you securely store your password. So as you can understand in an enterprise system, there will be numerous passwords. And uh, so obviously one single password for all applications is not very secure. So there are many passwords. And it's not possible for an IT administrator to remember everything and it's not secure to write down everything. So there's a key vault within the cloud system that helps you um, retrieve those passwords, retrieve the API keys, retrieve the certificates. So it's something analogous to a keychain in a MacBook, if you can relate. Um, and there's advanced threat protection. So advanced threat protection is a step up over your regular security. And it's, it's specifically designed for hybrid environments. Hybrid is uh, on-premise plus a public cloud to uh, monitor, detect and triage security threats. Azure Service Health is another dashboard, but this is a generic general dashboard that tells you how Azure services are doing across all regions across the world. It's a great way to see if that downtime that you're experiencing is a general Azure outage or is it only because of your application? So if there's an outage, you quickly verify, look at the Service Health dashboard and check if everything is fine everywhere, and then look at your application to make sure your application is not at fault. Um, we talked about policies, policy compliance, and Azure uh, from the vendor side is definitely compliant with almost all policies, um, all uh, worldwide governments have to have come up with. And this, this policy compliance is very essential in for even operating in certain countries. So they make sure that everything is very compliant. Uh, we have something called Azure government, uh, which is a, a dedicated government service. So. Uh, for the U.S. government, there are certain secret Azure regions uh, that we spoke about earlier. Uh, it's not just the secret regions, there's certain dedicated services that are used only by the U.S. government. Similarly, there are services and uh, storage needs of Germany and China that Azure has specifically taken care of. So this is another unique thing about Azure. No other service provider has taken care of Germany specifically. Um, so these are uh, services uh, specific to the government. and. Then again, in these cases, for these services, the general public does not have access to its government and secret only. So that's all about security and performance. In the next lecture, we'll look at what all of these costs in terms of money and how much can it cost and how are we going to make sure that it doesn't blow through the roof and how to keep costs down. So see you in the next lecture.
let's talk about Azure pricing and support. Pricing and support are both parameters that determine what cloud provider you ultimately choose. Uh, as you will see, uh, Microsoft Azure has a wide variety of pricing options and also support options. So let's look at pricing first. So uh, when you buy or subscribe to a Microsoft Azure service, you have three options. You have the online services program, you have the enterprise agreement, and you have the Microsoft customer agreement. So the Microsoft online services program is, um, is basically for individuals who want to subscribe to the cloud. And uh, as an added bonus, it offers a free trial service, 12 month free or 200 US dollar credit. And there are 25 uh, or more always free services that have a threshold, but they are always free until that threshold. This gives a great window of opportunity for new users, new cloud um, practitioners, and that can include you to log into Microsoft Azure and try out your um, um, you try out some of the services that are free. They'll obviously ask for a credit card and uh, an address, but as long as you stay within the free tier, uh, you should be fine and not paying a cent um, to Microsoft. So there, there is that free service, and um, then there's a paid service. So if you want to cross those thresholds, which you usually do when you're running a business and your business is using a cloud, um, then you have those paid subscriptions. Uh, there can be multiple subscriptions uh, that you can have under your account to organize billing. The second type is the enterprise agreement, which Microsoft uh, usually has with large corporations. So that's different from an individual account because uh, on an enterprise agreement, uh, you get what is known as a bulk discount. So you purchase or you promise upfront that you're gonna use this amount of service or this amount of storage for your company and then you get a proportionately high discount which is uh, not available with your individual um, billing accounts then there's microsoft customer agreement microsoft customer agreement is for a wide range of users and um, it can include individual users too but these are specific agreements targeted at specific corporations or specific individuals and they're basically tailored to their individual's needs so uh, the promise uh, remains, uh, the promise or the idea remains the same that you purchase a lot of uh, service or promise to buy a lot of service upfront and then you get a discount for the large purchase. So uh, not just Microsoft Azure, all of the cloud services are similar in terms of how you manage your expenditure in the cloud. So like I said, upfront committed payment is always cheaper than pay as you go. So if you promise to pay, promise to use a lot of their service and you uh, block your money with Microsoft, uh, then it's going to be cheaper in the long run than pay as you go. So the per unit prices are going to be lower is basically what it is. Um, use automatic cloud principles like elasticity and availability to limit the number of always on subscriptions. What this means is when you, when you size your systems, when you say that you need say five servers or 100 terabytes of storage, uh, don't sign up for a large amount immediately. You have to rely on the elasticity aspect of the cloud and you have to configure your system in such a way that it expands when it, when it needs it and contracts when it's not needed. The elasticity as aspect uh, prevents large unused chunks of storage or unused chunks of memory being going to waste. And you also shut down services when you no longer need them. So if you if the service that's running and nobody's using it, it's basically uh, running the meter, but you don't need it. So you shut it down and you save some money there. Uh, the same goes for the third point. So do not provision size more than what you need. So if you really need, what you really need is 32 gigs of RAM. You may offer 64, but don't do 128 because that's a waste and the, your systems won't be necessarily faster with more RAM, you just end up spending a lot more money. There's something called an Azure pricing calculator, which is a very elegant web interface cal calculator, which in which you input your uh, cloud requirements and it comes up with a price. And uh, it basically tells you how much 
you're going to spend if you configure systems in that particular manner. So Microsoft has a, has a unique benefit which other cloud providers don't have. That's a hybrid benefit. So if you have an existing Microsoft Windows license or Windows Server license or Windows SQL Server license, you can port that to the cloud. So you don't have to pay double. If you're already paying for a license, you can use that license and the money um, that you're already paying on premise for the cloud service. There's something called the total cost of operations or total cost of ownership calculator. And you can use that calculator to determine what to migrate to the cloud um, on based on how much you have uh, on premise. We come to another dashboard called Azure Budgets. Azure Budgets are uh, the best way to control your costs. So uh, on the on the budget budgets dashboard, you can uh, set up alarms to uh, that get triggered when you cross a certain threshold. Uh, you can analyze your cost visually. You can see what how much you spent last month, how much what was your maximum spending. It's basically like a utility bill. Um, depiction on a screen where you can see how much you have spent and how what is the projected spend based on your current usage. It's a very handy tool to cut on um, excess costs to save some money and to ensure that the money that is saved can be invested in the long run. That was pricing. Now we come to support. Uh, when it comes to support, uh, support is very important when uh, it doesn't look very important all the time, but when things go wrong, that's the most important thing uh, you'd ever want. So there are four types available that Microsoft makes uh, for um, for their cloud consumers. Uh, one is the basic support. So for all cloud customers, including individual customers, free tier, everybody, there's a there's basic uh, support. Uh, then there's a developer, which is a priced. All all support tiers above basic are priced, and uh, the recommended scope for a developer uh, support is trial and non-production environments. That's why it says developer. So a developer who's working on a cloud system and he has a support need, he can uh, you can e use the stereo support, the standard support. Those are all corporations and production workloads. And uh, um, the price you can see on the screen is $100 a month. But then again, with different uh, customer agreements, these change. So uh, the standard support is um, for a particular set of use cases like minimal business impact and they'll respond with eight hours and all that. It's a professional direct for companies that are absolutely non compromising on their support needs. Costs a lot of money, thousand dollars a month and business critical dependence and they will respond within one hour for any critical business impact. So we come to service level agreements. Service level agreements are uh, binding agreements that uh, and contractually binding agreements that two entities sign. So the customer and Microsoft sign this agreement and they agree to uh, follow a set of rules. So service level agreements is a, is a general, general term that is used for uh, service industries. And in this case, the, the computer component is offered as a service or a web service. Uh, and that's why we have service level agreements. But they are, uh, the point to remember is that they are specific to a particular Azure service. Um, uh, so uh, compute has a certain sort of service level agreement, which functions doesn't have and functions are different because it's the way those services are built that service level agreements have to be different. So storage has a different service level agreement. Load balances have a different service level agreement. And uh, since, uh, for example, the storage uh, service has different tiers. So it's, it can be a solid storage device. It can be regular traditional hard drive. And depending on the tier level of the service, uh, the sort of service level agreement can vary. So it can be uh, different for different tiers. So what happens in an application where you have different components, different uh, Microsoft services club together? So you multiply the service level agreements to find out what is the Microsoft a stated service agreement for that application. So congratulations, you've reached the end of the course and we will quickly sum up what we have learned and what we have uh, remaining in the two bonus sections that follow this, uh, this video. So we have learned a lot actually. You have started from uh, the basics of cloud computing, 
what is cloud computing and what's the buzz around it, what makes it different from a regular data center uh, setup, what are the choice of cloud vendors that you have, uh, example, Azure, AWS, and Google. Then we specialized into Microsoft Azure and we ran through the basics and we saw what the core services are. We went to a lecture on Azure security and realized that security is so important, especially in the cloud, which is a shared space. We also did some uh, look into Microsoft Azure performance. This performance is also very important because when it's the cloud, it's a, it's actually a server that's located so far away that you needed to perform over an internet connection. And then we looked at how much this all this costs in terms of price. Uh, we saw how to decrease or control our spending, um, how to make sure that we stick to our budgets. Uh, that was covered in pricing. And finally, uh, there was a there were a few links on the comparison of uh, various cloud vendor services. Uh, so comparing Azure with Amazon, comp comparing Azure with Google, and so on and so forth. So we have actually achieved quite a lot in this short lecture. And I hope that uh, you are equipped now to talk to technical people, salespeople, and everyone that matters, uh, and you are able to hold a regular discussion on uh, cloud computing, and especially Microsoft Azure. We, we still have something additional for you coming. Uh, there are a few uh, hyperlinks that I've shared on Microsoft Azure. Um, these are not mandatory, but go through these links when you have some time, and um, also Google around for or Azure topics, which you don't find in the, which you don't find a good description of in those papers, but you are interested in exploring further. Um, and so the internet is the best source of knowledge, always. And uh, then there is another section that is uh, that focuses on uh, the Azure fundamental certification. So all of this course was aligned towards the certification, so it gives you more. Um, uh, detail and it gives you more information on how to uh, go about the certification so there's fortunately there's just one link that you need to go through uh, and um, f find out what Microsoft's uh, procedure is to get certified what they expect for um, in the certification by no means the the amount of material taught in this course will be sufficient for your certification and you will need to explore it further I suggest that you go through Microsoft's own training first and then opt for external materials. Thank you very much. It's been a, a really great pleasure um, in creating this course and in interacting with you all. Thank you.